My name is Claire Lyons. I'm curator of antiquities here, and I'm delighted to welcome you all on this uh, gray Saturday afternoon. I can't think of a better place to be than here. Our guest speaker this afternoon comes to us from one of California's most celebrated national historic landmarks, the magnificent Hearst Castle. Let me share with you a story that Victoria Kastner told us of having first arrived at San Simeon Mansion as a tourist in the late 1970s. And as the name of the site actually implies, La Cuesta Encantada, Enchanted Hill, she was indeed enchanted and, quote, fell in love on the spot. Who wouldn't? What many of us do as when we visit. Victoria hastened to complete graduate work at Cal Poly, accepted a job at the estate, and never looked back. The 30 years that she has spent there more than qualify her for the title of historian of Hearst Castle. In this congenial setting, she earned two master's degrees, one in architectural history at UC Santa Barbara, and a second in museum management at George Washington University. The story of Hearst's astonishing collection and the buildings that house it have been the subject of wide-ranging lectures that Victoria Kastner has offered at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, as well as segments on the Discovery Channel, the Today Show, and numerous articles in the international press, just to name a very few. She is the author of Hearst Castle, the biography of a country house, which is sold out. But it's about to go into its 12th printing and will be available uh, next month. So I'll look for it on Amazon because this and her other most recent publication uh, are generate royalties that support uh, the foundation. Her latest book, which just appeared in 2009, is Hearst San Simeon, The Gardens and the Land. And as luck would have it, <laughs> here we are. This beautifully illustrated volume is available in our Villa bookstore. And um, I'm also pleased to welcome uh, the co uh, Victoria's, another Victoria, the second, the collaborator on this book, photographer Victoria Garagliano, who's here also with us today. And just a quick note that the book is available and that um, Ms. Kastner will come to the shop after the lecture and be there to sign copies. So don't miss that chance. Keep an eye out also for her forth, uh, forthcoming contribution to a study of American Gothic, which examines collectors like J.P. Morgan, Elis Isabella Stewart Gardner, and Hearst, who acquired medieval and early Renaissance objects. In the past year or so, two Los Angeles exhibitions have considered J. Paul Getty and William Randall, Randolph Hearst as connoisseurs of art and antiquities. Victoria Kastner will shed further light for us on the relationship between these two iconic collectors. And it is my greatest pleasure to warmly welcome her to the Getty Villa. Thank you, Claire. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. What a pleasure to be here. A pleasure and an honor. Um, I do want to uh, say again that my photographer and collaborator, Victoria Garagliano, is here, and also both of our respective assistants. I think for the first time, April um, Hatchett-Smith and Ruth Latson, who worked with us on um, this book, A Labor of Love, are also in the audience, so it's very meaningful. It's also very meaningful to be here, talking about a villa perched on a hill overlooking the Mediterranean, uh, that indeed William Randolph Hearst did call La Cuesta Encantada, the Enchanted Hill. Of course, he knew where the fog line was on a day like this. <laughs> and I, I believe the audience would enjoy the um, images even more if we were able to uh, turn the house lights down. Thank you. So he knew about how, in California, the marine layer means that the fog rolls like a curtain and comes in and hugs the coastline, and that there's a sunny mountaintop above, usually somewhere if one can find it, above the rivers of swirling mist. He knew this because he knew this landscape better than any other in his life. Uh, he was only two years old when his father first bought the property, and he started camping at Camp Hill with his family. Um, he was a lifelong collector, 
and he had a great influence on uh, another collector, a, a late-life collector, <laughs> mid and late life, and that's, of course, John Paul Getty. And that's what makes this a, such an important lecture, is that it's the, my first opportunity to examine uh, these two collectors and the influence that the older one had on the younger one. They were similar in many ways, uh, only sons, only children, raised by um, indulgent mothers, <laughs> very close to their mothers, um, went on with the family businesses. For Hearst, it was journalism uh, rather than mining, which was the first family business. For Getty, of course, it was oil. Uh, took fortunes, and of fortunes made empires. And um, they both had five sons, and of course, they both loved antiquities. And this is the original ranch house uh, here, just up the hill, the Spanish colonial house that um, Mr. Getty built. He bought this land in the 1940s and built this house in the early 1950s and opened it up for public admission in 1954, uh, free public admission. So they were also very similar, not only in their likes, but also in their desires that um, the beautiful objects they both loved should be shared with us all. And um, they also were inveterate travelers. Here you see Hearst the Tourist uh, at the Alhambra. And of course, that ranch house I just showed you was a Spanish colonial style um, building. And Hearst, of course, built San Simeon in a Spanish colonial style. They were almost 30 years um, apart in age. Uh, Hearst was born in 1863, uh, Jean-Paul Getty in 1892. But um, they did, as I say, share a love of uh, antiquities. And here you see him in uh, Jordan, posing uh, in, in front of some uh, very well-known ruins. It was this person who introduced them, Marion Davies. She was a great friend of Paul's, as Mr. Getty was known because she was his next-door neighbor. He had a beach house in Santa Monica, a little cabin. Marion Davies had something just a bit larger down the road. <laughs> this extraordinary um, architecture was built by architect William Flannery uh, in 1927, and it was actually a combination of three houses put together. and. Um, with uh, lots of uh, additions and remodeling, and uh, Julia Morgan designed the portion here nearest to me, which still stands, and of course, you know, the Annenberg Beach House, which is open to us all, uh, was recently put together as a, as a joint project of the city and the California uh, State Parks and the Annenberg Foundation. So, um, Paul used to go to Marion Davies's parties. She was her companion for uh, over 30 years, and that was how they met. And it was that that occasioned him coming to San Simeon as a guest to celebrate the new year in 1934. He really was not a collector at that point. He was putting all of his energy into his business. But he had, um, I, I think, a, a profound experience being a guest of William Randolph Hearst at, at San Simeon. This vast estate perched overlooking uh, the hills and down on the wide Pacific, designed to look uh, like a church on a hill city, as if Spain had never relinquished California. And of course, calling his first possession the ranch, and then collecting animals, as, as Paul Getty did, <laughs> may also have been influenced, because this kind of juxtaposition of cows and zebras is something that one can still see at San Simeon, which had the largest private zoo in America. And so that's how it looks when the fog pulls away. And William Randolph Hearst was 56 by the time he began to build it in 1919. And he worked on it for 28 years in collaboration with this woman, Julia Morgan, who was 47, America's first female architect of prominence. And together, they were involved in every aspect of design and construction. But of course, the story starts earlier than that. Paul Getty was similar to many other American collectors, coming to uh, collecting late in life or in midlife, uh, leaving business and wanting to leave some other kind of legacy in, in, as well as business. 
Uh, William Randolph Hearst was different. In, in his model, he was a bit more like an 18th century collector than an American magnate of the 19th or early 20th century. He really followed a profile more of the gentleman connoisseurs, the world travelers and esthetes like William Beckford and um, Horace Walpole, who with Fonthill Abbey and Strawberry Hill uh, displayed vast ranges of the wonders of God and man in their private uh, residences in the country and were deeply involved in every aspect of construction. Hearst was a lifetime collector. And we are fortunate um, because both he and Mr. Getty wrote volubly about collecting and their philosophy of it. And there's quite an extraordinary letter that Hearst, at 26, wrote to his mother, Phoebe Apperson Hearst, to give you an insight into his life as a collector. It was 1889. Phoebe Hurst would, um, was herself a collector, was very interested in archaeology, funded a great many uh, expeditions uh, of archaeology to the East, and then built a museum of archaeology and anthropology, uh, the Lowy Museum at the University of California Berkeley campus, which is now known as the Phoebe Apperson Hurst Museum in her honor. But she was in um, California and Will was traveling in Italy when he wrote his mother this letter. Dear Mama, why did you not buy Ansiglione's Galatea? It is superb. I have a great notion to buy it myself, in fact. The one thing preventing me is a scarcity of funds, as it were. <laughs> the man wants $8,000 for the blooming thing, and that is a little above my head. I have the art fever terribly. Queer, isn't it? I never thought I would get it this way. I never miss a gallery now. And I go and mosey among the pictures and statuary and admire them and wish that they were mine. My artistic longings are not altogether distinct from avarice, I am afraid. So I want some of these fine things, and I want you to have some of these fine things. And do you know, my beloved mother, there is a way in which you might get them. <laughs> if instead of buying half a dozen fairly nice things, you would wait and buy one fine thing, all would be well. As it is, we have things from New York to Washington and Washington to San Francisco, more than a house can hold, and yet not among them a handful such of the type that I mention. Ansiglioni says... It is a great time to buy. The government is nearly bankrupt. The people are heavily taxed. And soon some rich Englishman or American will step in and taking his chances here and there, will have a collection equal to one of our national galleries. I wish I could be the rich American. I wish you could be. How nice it would be if we could exchange all of our alleged masterpieces for a handful of the types such as I mentioned. In price, they are the same, but in value, how different. I am not going to buy any more trinkets. Then when I am old, I will not have had all that I wanted, but I will have all that I want, which is better. Go thou and do likewise, Mama dear. If you don't, You'll be angry with yourself next time you go abroad. I hear that some royal duke in Spain is coming to America with a collection of old masters, and will sell them there. Get one. Get a Murillo or a Velazquez. Don't get half a dozen pictures by artists no one's ever heard of. Get a Murillo or a Velazquez. Of course, get a Murillo and a Velazquez if you can. <laughs> and then save your money and buy again your wise and reverend son, W-R-H-P-S. If you can get Pop interested, he will do the business. He has a way of proceeding when he's interested that I rather admire. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with more than 32 years of scholarship about this one man and subject, I must say that I have uh, the feeling that I've barely begun, and that's a nice way to feel. Uh, but it does make it um, interesting, because he was a wonderful writer, and, uh, and, and also very funny. But, of course, this is a very unusual letter. 
because actually it was written by someone who could be described as America's number one trinket collector, actually. So, like a lot of us, he dispensed advice in his 20s, which he did not follow in later years. But an interesting thing I was thinking about when preparing this lecture is that in this subject, antiquities, William Randolph Hearst really did follow that advice. Though he bought widely age, origin, quality, um, and, and subject, the best and what he liked the best was this omnium gatherum kind of collector. With antiquities, he showed his great connoisseurship. And here's Pop and Mom, George Hurst, who made the money with the Comstock silver, Anaconda copper, and home state gold mine, and at 41 married a 19-year-old school teacher from the neighboring farm in the Merrimack River Valley in Franklin County, Missouri. And Phoebe Hurst, who loved education, first took Willie to Europe when he was only 10, and then he began collecting. She said, I've had difficulty convincing Willie that we cannot buy all that he sees. <laughs> he gets so excited that reason forsakes him, I too, confess the same difficulty. He went back as a boy of 16, and here you see him posing with a vase. He went back most years of his life as an adult. Uh, but his collecting was done in America and in uh, Britain, the great, the great uh, antiquities coming from London and, and New York sales. Um, but he, he was always a collector, and he was given the San Francisco Examiner by his father after Harvard asked him to leave in his junior year. <laughs> He said, for a certain deficiency of intellectual attainment and, and an excess of political enthusiasm. He also said late in life, it takes a good mind to resist education. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, this put him in New York, running a paper, just a, at the time of the wonderful sales that were going on. Um, and this, is, uh, this portrait he, uh, he posed for was in 1894, when he was 30. That's just about the time that of the great Spitzer sale. Frederick Spitzer was a wonderful collector of antiquities whose uh, collections went up for sale in 1893 in France. And um, these tanagra, these are two very small uh, votive uh, sculptures that they're between four and eight, in eight inches high, tiny and beautiful uh, molded terracottas. I'm showing you, Hearst actually didn't buy these till 1935, but he wanted some from the Spitzer sale. He hung around hoping to attend the sale himself but had to go back and run the newspapers. So he um, designated an agent to buy for him. But then he got nervous, and he cabled the agent. He said, of course, don't buy any of the darned things if they run up to fabulous prices. And then he awaited the results. Well, the Spitzer sale came and went. The um, prices were published in the paper, and someone else had gotten the Tanagras. And for lower than Hearst had declared he would go. He was incensed and contacted the agent, who said, I did not know the meaning of the word darned. But I looked it up, and it meant repaired. And these have been repaired because they're from the fourth century, so I thought you didn't want them. <laughs> so um, a cautionary tale in his early days of collecting. He did end up with Tanagras. Uh, Paul Getty had similar uh, difficulties wrote in his uh, book, The Joys of Collecting, about one time adjusting his shirt collar in a very uh, stuffy auction house, only to hear the word sold. <laughs> he had bought a view of distant London made in 1845 for 100 guineas by just adjusting his shirt collar. Um, so these were the, you know, the early phases of collecting and 18, in the 1890s. That's just about the time that Julia Morgan graduated from the University of California one of the first women to study engineering, and then it was due to Phoebe Hearst's encouragement that she went to Paris to study at the École des Beaux-Arts, where she was the first woman to graduate with a diploma from the school that had been created at the time of Louis XIV. It was a worldwide achievement, and she returned to California, and her first big project was this, the Greek theater at the University of California campus. The Greek theater, which was a commission for William Randolph Hearst. She wasn't the architect, she was the construction superintendent. Hearst gave a million dollars to the campus and they built the first open air Greek theater, so appropriate when we have one just outside, you know. But, uh, and he gave this to the campus when his mother was, was um, the, the great patron of the campus, funding everything from its worldwide architectural competition to its uh, almost entire structures and being the first woman to serve as its regent on the board. 
So this is probably where they met in the construction of the Greek theater in 1903. But Hearst's life was mostly in New York at that point, and his residence uh, was the Clarendon Apartments at 137 Riverside Drive. And these are just a few glimpses of it. Um, this is the Armory Hall. As I said, I just finished a great, uh, a, a, a scholarly chapter on the Gothic and um, uh, Renaissance objects in his collections, many of which were displayed at the Clarendon. Stained glass, tapestries, fantastic armor collection. This was the great hall where you see in the um, cases these Hispano-Moresque uh, Valencian lusterware pieces from uh, the medieval period that are now at the Cloisters uh, Museum in, in New York. But upstairs, there are no photographs of uh, the Greek room, which is where Hearst was uh, showcasing archaeological objects and a vase collection of, of, of such importance to him. He bought his first vase in the 1890s. He bought his last vase the year of his death in 1951. And one would have to go back to the 19th century to find a similar one. So he was buying vases at this time in New York and London. And I just threw in a couple of pieces because, of course, at the Getty Center, there was just a wonderful... Uh, uh, exhibition on jean Lee and Jérôme. Hearst knew Jérôme. He went to Paris with his mother Phoebe and had his portrait sculpted by Jérôme, and he bought Bonaparte at Cairo. Uh, Hearst Castle sent uh, Lodip, the, the Oedipus, and um, you know, Napoleon at the Sphinx to, for exhibition at that show, but they didn't send the Bonaparte at Cairo, so I thought you'd like to see it. Or uh, the Metropolitan sent the painting that Jérôme did of this very sculpture, Pygmalion and Galatea. He falls in love with a sculpture so beautiful that the gods took pity on him and turned her into a living woman. And here you see him reaching up, and it was actually a painted statue he acquired in 1910. And this is in the vestibule at San Simeon. He was spending more and more time on the West Coast, and this is the view of San Simeon. I'm so glad my photographer is here because you can see she's done an absolutely magnificent job of, of uh, photographing the place. Hearst owned all of that land uh, that you see, and he camped with his wife, Millicent, and his five sons, the way he had camped with his mother and father in boyhood. And he wrote to Phoebe in 1917, I love this ranch. It is wonderful. I love the sea, and I love the mountains and the hollows in the hills, and the shady places in the creeks, and the fine old oaks, and even the hot, brushy hillsides full of quail, and the canyons full of deer. I would rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. And as a sanitarium, mother, it has Nauheim, Carlsbad, Vichy, Saratoga, French Lick, and every other so-called health resort beaten a nautical mile. And two years after that letter, when Phoebe died in the influenza epidemic, Hearst, at age 56, inherited the land he'd known all of his life, walked into Julia Morgan's office and announced he was old for tents and thinking of building a little something. And just as the great villa uh, where we are today was, was inspired by a specific building, so was San Simeon, inspired by Santa Maria la Mayor in Andalusia, the church that you see in Ronda, and then on the other side of Julia Morgan's drawing of it. And... Um, you know, Hearst is not a church goer. Again, it's that sort of think of Beckford or, or, or um, uh, Horace Walpole using the, the um, religious art as a, as a means of uh, uh, creating a feeling of romance. So Casa Grande has its bell towers. And Hearst was acquiring, and, and we have a thousand letters that he exchanged with Julia Morgan. And he said, I bought these herms from the Hope Collection. Now we'll see many pieces from the collection of the great antiquarian and Regency designer Thomas Hope. He said, and I think they should go in front of house A, where I have drawn the little circles. So here they are, these magnificent uh, herms, which uh, date back to the first century. And what's surprising about Hearst is that there was no interior decorator, there was no landscape architect, there was no designer, and he was not um, led by dealers. He was acquiring his own pieces. And as I said, when it comes to antiquities, he always had an eye to the great collections of the late um, 18th century. And here's what Casa del Mar, is, it was, this was his house, this pair of three cottages. This is what it looked like, and you see the top square windows. This is what it looks like in the inside. And one of the first letters we have from Hearst to Morgan begins, the main thing at the ranch is the view. And it did supersede everything else. 
When he was in New York, he bought, at the same time that he acquired that Pygmalion and Galatea, this Muses sarcophagus, the beginning of, the, of some of his fine funerary uh, pieces that we'll see. And he had sarcophagi, these are Roman burial tombs that were created around the third century as funerary sculpture, a time uh, when, when the deceased became an important part of, the crea of mourning, and so they were honored with these pieces. And he bought this from that same sale in 1910 of Samuel Yorkies. Most of the objects he had at San Simeon he purchased after 1919. You know, I think the impression one has is that he bought everything first, laid it in a big field or something, and then they make a house, but that's not how it happened. Most of the pieces were acquired after, less than 5% before, but this is one of the important pieces that Hers wrote to Julia Morgan about. So it is the nine muses who, who um, were the daughters of Zeus, from whom, of course, we get our word museum. And right in the middle, with her helmet, a goddess of war and of wisdom, Athena, and then this, the deceased. His head looks different, his face different, because the entire piece was carved, except for his head, which was then carved from a block as a funerary portrait of the deceased, who must have, in, in life, loved art, because in death, he was one with the muses, holding the lyre and pictured as Apollo. So Hearst was buying these funerary objects. He bought um, in a very important, uh, piece, a, a, a cinerarium, a, an urn, and this is also from a major collection, the, collect, the, the, the Hope Collection. He bought this in the 30s, but this piece was on the um, front of the house, right, uh, uh, waiting, and it was created uh, and inscribed by a, a son to his father, the Emperor uh, Vespasian, and this was made in the first century in Rome. So he's buying in New York, and he's living in New York, and his wife Millicent is there, but very, very few um, times after about 1925 does Mrs. Hearst journey to California. Uh, they never divorced, but they separated. It was a permanent separation, and she lived on the opposite coast, facing the opposite ocean, in a place called um, Beacon Towers, which she renamed St. Joan in Sands Point, Long Island, that Hearst bought for her in 1927, because he was living on the West Coast with Marion Davies. Warm, funny, kind, generous to a fault. It was she not only who introduced Paul and William Randolph Hearst, but who brought all of the movie people to San Simeon and who animated the place with her, her spirit and her kindliness. And the movie people were definitely around. Charlie Chaplin, whom you see here, was called the court jester. He stands with Georges Jumier, who was kind of the professional Frenchman of Hollywood movies until Maurice Chevalier took the mantle from him. So where are they standing? In front of a sarcophagus of Demeter and a copy of the Three Graces. And this sarcophagus, which now it appears uh, is actually a 19th century uh, forgery, and we do have those at San Simeon, uh, not, not a lot considering a percentage, but like any collection, one does. Uh, Paul's first um, object from antiquity was a, was a tanagra. I meant to say that when I showed you the tanagra, and it turned out to be a Victorian recreation rather than a 4th century BC piece. But anyway, this, um, it's based on a relief in Sorrento. Um, Hearst had these sarcophagi in front of all of the cottages. Here you see another, it's maybe a wellhead, it may be a, a sippus, a, a, another um, funerary piece, but decorating it, of course, is Cary Grant who was at the castle so many times that um, he stayed in a different room each time he came back and was there as a guest more than two dozen, on two dozen occasions. So here you see these pieces right in front of the main house, given the uh, pride of place. Hearst had reproductions of very famous pieces, like The Wrestlers, the original from antiquity is in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. But he also had fine originals, and after 1927, he wrote to Julia Morgan, a great many fine things are coming to the ranch, finer than heretofore. I had no idea when I began to build at San Simeon that I would spend so much time here, or that it would become so important to me, but I see no reason not to make it a museum of the best things that I can secure. And that included the oldest of his antiquities, the four figures, two fragmentary heads, two full figures of the goddess the Egyptians called the Powerful One. Sekhmet, with the body of a woman and the head of a lioness, these granite and diorite, that's the pink vein through the top figure here, a natural occurring vein of diorite, these new kingdom pieces, 
uh, dating back to the 18th, 19th dynasty, these, uh, her spot between 1924 and 1930, when, of course, Egyptomania was sweeping through the country after Howard Carter's incredible discoveries. And you see how they put the, um, the pink limestone columns beside the segment figures to bring out that uh, diorite and feldspar contrast. Here you see a, a, a close-up. So bloodthirsty that um, she almost ate up the entire human race. And the other gods got a little nervous about it, so they gave her pomegranate juice and got her drunk and told her it was human blood till she fell asleep and thus we all were saved. But here you see the, the power of these figures. There were a, a thousand Sekhmets that were uh, created in the time of Amenhotep and uh, that were near the temple of Mut. So Mediterranean, not just from Greece and Rome, but, but from the opposite side of the Mediterranean. And Mediterranean gardens, just as you find here at the villa. And Casa Grande, as he called it, the big house, which it certainly is, 115 rooms on four stories it has, with this wellhead in the, in the foreground, which Hearst uh, brought back from Verona for his mother. So definitely an homage to the um, influence of Spain on California's architecture. Uh, in, as I said, in, on New Year's Eve of, of uh, 1934, Paul first came you know, at, to San Simeon and was a guest. And this is the assembly room, or the big room, as they called it. It's a complicated room, but I want to tell you what, what it looked like when Paul was there and show you. But just to give you a, an um, example, the place I'm going to want you to look is right here. There's nothing here now, but you're going to see there used to be something quite momentous there. The reliefs are by Torvaldsen, the great Danish neoclassical sculptor. And Hearst was interested in the neoclassical, not just the ancient. The piece you just barely see here is the Venus by Torvaldsen. And then in this corner and this corner, there are other Venuses. But when Paul came, it looked like this. No reliefs. Those came in from Victor Rothschild's ballroom in 1937 as one of the great sales of London townhouses. This is 1934, circa, and this piece, the Hope Athena, was uh, something Hearst had coveted for a long time. It came from the great uh, collection of, of Hope, and there had been a huge sale in 1917, and Hearst was undercapitalized and, you know, until he received his inheritance, and he wasn't able to buy it. But in 1933, he purchased this magnificent piece that came through the hands of, of William Hamilton, Sir William Hamilton, into the collection of Thomas Hope. And um, so a, a very eminent piece that is now at uh, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art at LACMA. But it was something that Paul would have seen, most likely. And then the, the um, Torvaldsen, you see here, Hearst bought that from the Spanish galleries in 1929. So Venus's and this grand Athena this magnificent piece is one of the finest works of ancient sculptor, uh, sculpture to exist in America. And Hearst donated it to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art the last year of his life. He was the um, single largest donor to the museum, in, uh, beginning in 1942, the last nine years of his life. But this is certainly the finest piece, inspired by the great work in the Parthenon by the sculptor Phidias. So it's a Roman second century piece. And it's related to a piece that we'll see later that was Mr. Getty's. On the opposite side, I told you down here, Hearst had the first century Venus torso that was classical. And then here's a good look at Bertel Torvaldsen's Venus. She holds the apple she received as the, uh, at the uh, successful conclusion of the race uh, that made her the, the world's most beautiful woman. And then here is a close-up of, well, there were four of these medallions also by Bertolt Torvaldsen. They were metaphors um, of justice, wisdom, uh, strength, and health. This is justice, and so you see Zeus, the greatest of the gods, with his thunderbolt and his eagle, and then Nemesis, the goddess of revengeful justice. She's reading the, the deeds of mankind with her foot on the wheel of time. Hearst bought these pieces, as I say, in the great London sales of the middle 30s. And when, I think from, from the Lansdowne collection, uh, from the Hope collection. And uh, he was always someone, as I said, who made up his own mind. And his prize piece from the uh, Lansdowne sale, which happened in 1930, was this neoclassic work in the corner. Well, here you see the, what I just showed you, one of the medallions. 
And oh, also, this is a first century bust of the Empress Faustina in front of a Rubens tapestry. But here you see this Venus of Canova. She clutches the draperies to her. After Napoleon uh, took the original ancient Venus, Canova was commissioned to create a replacement for her from the Uffizi, but he ended up sculpting four versions of the Venus uh, of his own hand, and they really became his own compositions. This is a, a, a magnificent piece, and one of the amazing things about it, it was made in 1805. It was in the collection of Lucien Bonaparte. For many years, until 1995, it was listed among art historians as missing. William Randolph Hearst's father, George Wilson, bid on it at the uh, sale of the Marquis of Lansdowne in 1930. And it's unusual that it should be listed as missing because it's been seen by 42 million people. <laughs> but Hearst was really not thought of as a connoisseur. And I think that there's this in common, too, between the villa where we are now and San Simeon, that, that people, um, when these places first opened, at least the cognoscenti, felt that um, they were, you know, vulgar, uh, gaudy, beneath contempt, and the art historians stayed away in droves. From that same great Lansdowne sale came this funerary stele of a woman in the center with her hair uh, like uh, Agrippina, and a hus her husband to uh, my right, and then probably her brother on the opposite side. And the great Lansdowne bust of Athena. This came from Gavin Hamilton, who was another antiquarian like Sir William Hamilton, and threw that into the Lansdowne collection bought by Fitzmaurice, the first Marquis of Lansdowne. The Lansdowne house still exists, though much of it has been torn down, but it's on Barclay Square. and. Um, because of the death duties, you know, that so many of the British collections were dismantled at the time. So Hearst gave this magnificent piece to uh, LACMA. And Getty uh, very much wanted something from the Lansdowne sale, but at the last moment, it was withdrawn. Hearst wanted it too. The Lansdowne Heracles. It was the single finest, most treasured piece, and the family withdrew it. And it was 1951 the year of Hearst's death, that Getty found out when he was chatting with friends at Christie's the incredible news that through Spink and Son, the London dealers, it might be possible to acquire the Lansdowne Hercules, or as it's also known by its Greek name, the Lansdowne Heracles. This piece had such a major influence on Mr. Getty that I think we owe, we owe its presence to our presence today, being in this extraordinary museum. He was fascinated with the Emperor Hadrian, and this had been in Hadrian's villa. It was excavated in the 1790s, and um, he showcased it here, as you see, uh, in, in his original museum with the two lions beside. First, it was outside, actually, in the driveway, in the courtyard, but then he moved it inside. He had written a novel, Paul had written a novel called A Journey in Corinth, about an, a landscape architect who ends up uh, taking refuge on a series of events in um, the Villa Papiri, Hadrian's Villa. So, um, you know, that kind of was the beginning, acquiring a piece like this, uh, making him feel that he needed to have a villa to showcase this. And I hope if you have time, you'll go, you'll go visit the temple setting for the Temple of Heracles that's here at the villa today, because, of course, you can still see this object. Um, Hearst had similar showcasing back at San Simeon. We have a, a mosaic floor from Ostia, and uh, some fragmentary torsos up against the window with double lions. He bought these in the 30s. This um, beautiful first century uh, fragment of uh, the torso of a youth and this massive work, uh, which was on the opposite wall, either Neptune or a seated Mercury, probably part of uh, a much larger group setting. And he was just uh, beginning uh, to rise. And then... Three years after Hearst bought the Hope Athena in 1933, the incredible happened. The Hope Hygieia was available for sale. These pieces had been together. They had been excavated together. They had been created together. And here you see Hygieia, the, the daughter of Asclepius, the god of health, and she's feeding the serpent out of the bowl that she holds in her hand. And he bought the Hope Hygieia 
And that also, among many, many other pieces from the Hope, Hamilton, and Lansdowne collections, uh, was donated to LACMA in his lifetime. But one of the greatest examples of the kind of 18th century spirit of his collections was the library upstairs. One could call this his Greek room on the West Coast. An incredible assemblage of wonders. Remember I told you, Hearst bought his first face as a young man in the 1890s and his last face the year of his death. And in this area, he really was a tremendous connoisseur. And you see how they were just sitting out all around the tables. He had over 400 examples and he allowed scholars to come study them. Um, the vases, uh, there were many liquidations because Hearst had money troubles, but he never sold the vases. After his death, they were moved and warehoused, and many of them have gone to other great museums, including LACMA and the Metropolitan uh, in New York, uh, but they were not sold in the dispersals. But here you see what the library looks like today. This Hearst Hydria is one, this may be the earliest uh, Greek vase in Hearst collection. We know he bought it in 1899. And it was named the Hearst Hydra. It has rounded, uh, it's, it was a water carrier. It has the two handles you can see plus a water handle on the back. And this is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art now. And on the top it has uh, men wearing striped robes and enormous roosters. These are cocks here, enormous ones. And then lotuses. And so on this top part, it's very Athenian in its style. It's 6th century BC. But down below, these panthers and goats are very Corinthian. And so it's quite a remarkable piece because it's a fusion of both of those influences. And since Simeon still today, we have um, uh, more than 150 examples. Uh, this is red figured, a little bit um, more recent. This dates back to the fifth century BC, and it's called the fruit pickers. And you see the women, uh, all three of them, one is shaking the tree with a look, she's wearing um, a snood here on her hair, and a look of determination. And the apples are falling into this basket. So these are wonderful. This is a, it's a kind of water carrier um, uh, as well. And we also have amphora. This is a piece that is at the Metropolitan today. And this was uh, created by the, someone that's now known as the Troilus painter, about 14, uh, excuse me, 490, 490 BC. And it's uh, Demeter, the goddess of the corn, uh, gave the corn to humanity, and so that's why you see this charioteer flying through the sky with, with such relief with all of the black field and then the red figure bursting out, which is the actual color of the um, clay body. And he's distributing grain to humanity. A couple of pieces that are at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art at LACMA. This is a centaur, half man, half horse, carrying a flaming torch, being led by a satyr. They're on their way to a party, most clearly. And um, that's something that centaurs and satyrs both knew how to do exceptionally well. And these craters were used to mix wine and water uh, for an event that was called a symposium, which was a drinking uh, activity uh, indulged in by uh, males only that was the great kind of after-dinner social event in Greek life. And then another piece from... Uh, LACMA, this also, from this one and that last one, we're in the Hope Collection. This is known, uh, the, the artist is known as the Deep Dean Painter. That was the country house of Thomas Hopes in Surrey. And here you see Athena, a goddess of wisdom in war, with her very favorite half-man, half-god, Hercules, Heracles, and she's pouring uh, wine for him. One of the pieces that's still at San Simeon, this cista, or a kind of a cosmetic uh, holder for, you know, women's objects. It's called the crowning of victory. And what you see here, this is, this is much, much older, Etruscan, pre, pre the, you know, the Greek period, third, third century. Um, and you see that this is the servant and he's rushing to stop the horses. This is bronze, incised bronze. This is a, a woman and a satyr on the top. And then here is the crowning. Here's the laurel wreath. And here's the victor. And there's the bird showing that he's going faster in flight even than the birds do as, as he wins the chariot race. But the finest of the vases of the 150 we still have at San Simeon is this by the Dipolon Painter Workshop. This date back, dates back to 780 BC. 
and it's that style known as attic geometric, and so you see a lot of um, very regular geometric patterns and a very spirited series of horses and single-wheeled chariots, a row of five of them around this magnificent vase, and um, some of the uh, warriors are wearing shields. When Paul came to San Simeon in 1934, he, he wrote later on, he said, I guess I like splendor, I like a great room, I like silver, uh, fine tapestries. He said, if San Simeon um, had been closer to a city, I would have bought it. <laughs> and he said, I guess I compare myself to Hearst. He said, because Hearst really did live like an emperor and compared to San Simeon, Sutton Place, which was the house uh, in Britain where Paul lived from the 1960s on, he said, Sutton Place is a manor house compared to San Simeon. He told a poignant story about his lovely hostess, Marion Davies, posing here by an oil jar. When they dined in the refectory, Marion, who drank and Hearst wished she wouldn't, downed her cocktail and then asked Paul if she could have his. Hearst overheard it and said, no, Paul, don't. And he, was, he had great consternation. What was he going to do? His hostess had asked. She was his friend and a delightful person. His host had said no. Hesitantly, what he did was reach out and quite accidentally knock over the cocktail and spill it all over the table. <laughs> and Hearst said later that it was the most diplomatic and gracious way of handling <laughs> an awkward event. I think, you know, when you see the landscape and you see this Arcadian nature, then I think you can get a feeling. Uh, Arcadia was a real place, you know, to, in the ancient world, a, an idealized place, but, um, you know, a place of peace and happiness. You get that sense at San Simeon. And Julia Morgan was so involved with every aspect of creating it. Here you see her working with Hearst. They never had a romance, but they had a tremendous affinity for one another. And though there's no evidence that she ever set her foot into a large body of water, we don't know if she even knew how to swim, she certainly knew how to take this wonderful theme of swimming pools and create absolute sorcery, magical, magnificent swimming pools at San Simeon. And this one they ins was inspired, the Roman plunge, as they call it, by an, an ancient Roman bath. And you see right here, she says, Roman bath study for Mr. William Randolph Hearst. It's dated 1931, one of her drawings. And this is the, the statue, is the Canova Venus, which they didn't put in a swimming pool, you know, but, but had indoors, as you saw. Um, this, from Ostia, mosaic of Scylla and the fishes, is at the vestibule of, of um, San Simeon, second century AD that Hearst bought in the early 20s. But they created with the... With the um, mosaic uh, artisans, they created their version of it on the floor of the Roman pool. The same Scylla, and then there are also octopi and um, dolphins. And then Hearst bought and had created copies of very, very famous statues, many of them in the collections of the, Ven uh, of the Vatican. The Venus, and then the, the, the scraper, this is a piece from the Vatican. And then they raised the statues up on plinths so that their full reflection would shine down into the water. So the pool was just completed when Paul visited and saw the Roman plunge. And of course, San Simeon has not one pool, but two. And this one, known as the Neptune Pool, uh, shows how they took pieces of antiquity and created something very modern out of it. Or as the great architect and architectural historian who had an office right here in Southern California, Charles W. Moore, called this a grand liquid ballroom where the gods and goddesses of the silver screen comported themselves far above the world below. Well, Hearst bought the temple columns from a gallery, the San Giorgi Gallery in Rome in 1922. And they are composites. Um, not all of the bases are from antiquity, but the, the light ones are. And... Um, the statues at the top, Neptune's head grazing, as it never would have done in antiquity, these were three-dimensional pieces that are from the 17th century that had been in the collection uh, of uh, Verdi. 
And Hearst writes, Julia Morgan, he bought them in 1922 from French and Company. He says, dear Miss Morgan, we must do something with Neptune, who, while not overly attired, is an elderly gentleman with whiskers, who lends an air of respectability to the establishment. <laughs> Written by one elderly gentleman about another. But anyway, the, the Neptune with his sea nymphs, the Nereus, one on seahorse and one on a sea cow, were set into concrete to look like a temple relief. There are bits of the cornice and some of the architrave that are actual fragments of, uh, from antiquity, the lotus palmette pattern, right about here, these are the original pieces. But a real tremendous mixture, and then also, uh, capitals which date back um, to about the second century. So it was a tremendous mixture of old and new, and sometimes they would take a, an original piece, like this first century double bust, and use it as only the inspiration for cast concrete lamp standards that ornament the pool. Hearst was spending a great deal of money, and Paul Getty talked about that too. In As I See It, the book that was published the year that he died, in 1976, he wrote, he wrote, I make it a practice in my life to live on 5% of my income and invest the other 95% of it. And I believe William Randolph Hearst does it the other way around. <laughs> well, that was very true, and um, he ended up with a tremendous uh, financial disaster in the 30s. Uh, he was $87 million in debt and facing imminent bankruptcy, and over half of everything he owned he sold, because San Simeon was just one of, of seven major houses that he owned. And, and they tried to liquidate things quietly through sales at um, Sotheby's, Christie's, they took the silver in 37. The Americana collection went to New York through Park Burnett in 38. But nobody had any money, and in order to liquidate things quickly, they opened the fifth floor of Gimbel's department store on Herald Square. And tens of thousands of people came in off the street, and lots of objects at that point were sold. And that was when Getty bought a piece from the Hearst Collection, which is still here today, and that is this mosaic. He bought it in 1941. Orpheus, whose music was so beautiful that he mesmerized all the beasts, is in the center. And then the four women are at the four corners, uh, representing the four seasons of the year. Hearst did not sell the, the Greek faces with all the liquidations that happened. But in 1956, the Hearst Foundation uh, donated many things, and the Metropolitan ended up with 65 examples, including this magnificent work by the Berlin painter. The man is playing a kithara or a cithara. It's a two-stringed lyre or harp. He's singing. And the body of the amphora, with these would be used for water or grain or olive oil storage, the body of the amphora seems to suddenly somehow animate him. And you can see that his long sash is actually moving in the breeze that's created by his elation and his song. It was a bad time for Hearst in the time of the liquidations because that was when Orson Welles, in 1941, created Citizen Kane. And here you see the locked gate with the big K, and in the distance, uh, Mont Saint-Michel was the inspiration for what became known as Xanadu, but people thought it was a documentary filmed at San Simeon. And of course, it starts with the deathbed scene. Hearst didn't die for another decade. But it certainly was an indelible way for a media man to be remembered by a, a historic, uh, not by historic events, but by a media event, by a film that was just about as accurate as one of the Hearst newspapers. And, you know, really, he certainly knew the power of the media. And uh, it, Marion Davies said, uh, you know, who am I to tell Orson Welles what to do? You know, he should make his own way. But, but anyway, Orson Welles actually apologized because the opera singing uh, Susan Alexander Kane, the second wife of Charles Foster Kane in the film, everyone assumed was, an, since she was an opera singer who couldn't sing, that that must have been Marion Davies who couldn't act. And it was a harsh thing to do to Marion's career. Here you see Susan doing the jigsaw puzzles, and um, Orson Welles actually said, he wrote the, the introduction to Marion's memoirs long after she died and said, as the person most responsible for casting the shadow of Susan Alexander Kane over Marion Davies. I rejoice in this opportunity to remark that theirs was a great love story, and love is not the subject of Citizen Kane. But of course, by the time he wrote that in the 1970s, everyone had seen the film and decided that San Simeon must be Xanadu. And at the end, if you remember, uh, all of his art is being evaluated 
and determined to be worthless. And that was the image that stayed uh, associated with Hearst and also with San Simeon. He made his money back. He had two more years of buying and building. He came back to San Simeon in his 80s for one final grand crescendo. And here you see him with Marion Davies. They're goofing around, playing hide-and-seek on his airplane. But he died in her home in Beverly Hills. And it's uh, at 1007 Beverly. And uh, he died on the 14th of August of 1951. So I said, Paul talked about buying San Simeon and said he would have it if it had been closer to a city. But instead, of course, he created his own museum here and decided, first he was thinking of a Spanish colonial style or there was discussion of a modern style. Then he decided to build inspired by the Villa Papiri. And I'm honored that we have uh, the architect and first director of the museum here today, Stephen Garrett, my friend. And um, the remarkable thing, I think, about these two individuals is how much they both did for California. Getty gave his magnificent Artabile carpet to LACMA. Hearst was the single greatest donor that LACMA has ever known. And recently, the, um, this magnificent view, don't, don't you agree, my photographer is amazing. Um, yeah, Victoria, yeah. This magnificent view will always be saved because um, there's been a conservation easement and the land, 85,000 acres of the family ranch has been saved, and 1,000 acres, 13 miles of coastline, which Malibu, of course, once resembled, has just been donated to California state parks and will never be developed. And we, all of us, are the beneficiaries of these extraordinary visionaries who both believed that we would know what to do with a bounty that we were given. When Getty died and the amazing news appeared that, that the museum had received his inheritance, it was a staggering uh, revelation. Hearst had arranged that San Simeon would be donated to the University of California and be an art museum. That, after all, had been the philanthropy of the family for so many years. But they turned it down as prohibitively expensive, and as you can see from the coastline, very, very far from their Berkeley campus. And so it was donated to um, the California State Parks, which have been good stewards of it, and as I said, have shared it with 42 million people. Many, many donors, when they leave a great bequest, feel it necessary to leave specific instructions for posterity. But neither Getty nor Hearst felt that. Getty said, it's not how much money you have, it's what you do with it. And Hearst said, the enjoyment I've had from these objects is nothing to the enjoyment others will have from them. It's important for art to come to America. It all ends up in museums, and not everyone can go abroad. But here in California, we are all the beneficiaries of one of the most extraordinary series of collections ever assembled. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have a moment, do we? We do have a moment, and uh, Victoria Kastner will answer some questions as soon as the lights come out, and we have staff on either side with microphones, so I'd appreciate it if you'd raise your hand and then wait for the microphone so that everyone can hear the question. <coughs> and I'll let you... Anything occurring to you right off? Yes? Where do I live? <laughs> Well, you did see there was an awful lot of green around the castle, wasn't there? <laughs> yeah, um, we all live in the nearby area. I live south of the castle, about um, an hour away, near San Luis Obispo, in a little town called Los Osos, Cañada de los Osos, which means the Valley of the Bears. Yeah. 
Other questions? Yes. Thank you for the lovely lecture. Is this on? Yeah. You're welcome. I've been dying to know since the Jerome exhibit, since the Napoleon painting, for some reason ended up being my absolute favorite, even though I loved every painting. I was dying to know, and here you're the perfect person to tell me, is it in a room, because I haven't been in 15 years to Hearst, is the painting in a room that is open to the public? Yes, if you would like to visit the Jerome paintings, Thank you. Bonaparte at Cairo and Napoleon at the Sphinx, they both ornament, the, the, you should take two or two, they both ornament the top uh, story of the house known as the Celestial Suite. And also are there, uh, is Luc Olivier Merson's uh, um, uh, Rest on the Flight into Egypt, which also shows the Sphinx. Hearst bought these from uh, the art dealer Nodler in uh, 1898 and then 1913. So they were among the early, uh, earlier of his acquisitions at San Simeon. Other questions? We'll come to, yes, have you one? Yes. Question is, um, who owns more antiquities? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Getty for certain, but there is a difference uh, in, in that um, her said, uh, Mr. Getty said in The Joys of Collecting, and, you know, he wrote The Golden Age, The Joys of Collecting, he wrote so many things about collecting. And of course we have so many letters and uh, columns from Hearst, it's wonderful uh, when these people are, are voluble. It's good for us all. But Mr. Getty said there's two ways to go about things. You can be Hearst and buy everything, or you can specialize, and I have chosen to specialize. And he listed his five categories of collecting. Roman antiquities was number one. Um, this, the second one was Renaissance paintings. Third was Persian carpets. Remember, this is 1965, so we're looking at the ranch house, you know, mentally in your, in your mind, not, not the villa, which he doesn't get the idea for till 1968, and which isn't built, you know, which is built in the uh, mid-70s. Uh, and opens to the public in 1974. So, so um, Persian carpets was number three, Savonnerie carpets was number four, and then French decorative arts was number five. Uh, he had stayed in the apartment of Mrs. Frederick Guest in New York in the 30s and felt that being around beautiful objects made a tremendous uh, difference in his life, and then he did, uh, resolved to collect. Now, Hearst obviously collected... Um, everything, and as I say, all of his life. In terms of quantity of objects, Hearst has it hands down. And of course, what's interesting about both of them is that what they chose to do was buy the finest pieces from the greatest collections which had been assembled in the 18th and early 19th century. The Hope Athena and the Hope Hygieia and the Lansdowne Heracles, you know, I, I can't say what, which is best. I mean, they're all magnificent, and they all were excavated at the same time, and they were all created in the second century, Roman sculptures based on Greek originals which have long disappeared. And in the collections of Thomas Hope, in, in his vast catalog, the Hope Athena was number one. The Hope Hygieia was number two. Hearst bought them from two different sales, reassembled them, gave them, you know, showcased the Athena at San Simeon, as I showed you, and then gave the Hygieia to LACMA in 1950 and the Hope Athena to LACMA in 1951. So these ancient pieces created together, residing together in the ancient classical world are together again in Los Angeles. Thank you so much, everyone.